for me, and, and I believe that everyone's entrepreneurial journey is different and what draws you to it differs. So for me, that, that myth of like, it has to be about like, how do you scale and get that hockey stick growth? For me, that, that wasn't what was motivating for me. It's how do I get that hockey stick impact? Brooke Finley is an innovator, change maker, and purpose-driven entrepreneur. She's a Canadian immigration expert and founder of Navio. Navio unlocks the infinite possibilities of human potential to co-create a better world by making immigration legal services more affordable, transparent, and trustworthy. Brooke Finley is with us here today on Startup Different. Hey, Dave here. Before we get into today's episode, Chris and I wanted to give you some exciting news. We wrote a book. Surprise. It's called Startup Different, the myth-busting blueprint for your multi-million dollar business. And it comes out October 1st, 2024. Like our show, we're trying to pay it forward to our fellow entrepreneurs to help you learn from our successes and failures. The book busts over 33 myths, tells some of our most hilarious stories, and gives you many of our best tools to build, scale, and exit your business. Pre-orders for paperback, ebook, and audiobook start Labor Day, Monday, September 2nd. You'll find the book at all the major online retailers, including Amazon. Check it out. We think it's pretty great. And now, on to the show. Hello, folks, and welcome to Startup Different. I'm Dave, he's Chris, and today we have another guest. It's Brooke. Brooke Finley, how are you doing today? Hey, Dave. I'm doing really well. Thanks so much for having me here. Oh, hey, we're happy to have you. And actually, I'm just going to say for the studio audience, uh, I guess not the studio audience, but just the audience, that I am very excited to see Brooke again because Brooke and I go way back. We actually worked together what feels like a million years ago uh, at a constituency office for the then Speaker of the House of Commons of Canada. So that's, <laughs> if that's not special to you, I don't know what is. Like that's, that's unbelievable, right? Yeah, so. yeah. No, I, I think another learned, another time, like another world. Feels yeah, like. seriously. I think we learned a lot of startup lessons, right? In our time in the constituency office, helping with passport applications. But actually, in government? <laughs> in government. You know what, though? It actually kind of dovetails well into sort of what you do now with your company, Navio. And I'm super yeah. excited to hear about this. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were, you know, one of the impact startups at the Collision Conference in Toronto. You you did a pitch in front of a whole bunch of people, like 82 hundred people. Um, that's awesome. Like, tell me about Navio. What do you guys do? How did you get into this? I'm really interested in your story. Yeah, actually it's kind of a story of fell into it and then just hit the ground running. So, um, I became a regulated Canadian immigration consultant in 2016, running a kind of traditional, what you would imagine as a traditional consulting firm, um, in the legal space. So, uh, you know, that really kind of stuffy, unapproachable, outdated type of thing where we're helping people. I mean, the work that we do is very impactful, but the method of delivery um, just hasn't changed uh, and, and is kind of quite out of alignment with what consumers are looking for. So um, just working in that space, I was trying to find a way, how do we make this better? Like the impact of the work we do, helping people come to Canada to work, to study, to live permanently, helping Canadian employers who are looking to fill labor and skill shortages with talented people from around the world. That impact is massive. We're building communities. We're growing our economy. We are fueling innovation. Um, and it's the way that we were delivering the service was inaccessible for many, many, many people. So I've been over a number of years just trying to imagine how might we reinvent this. And that's where, when we developed Navio and Navio platforms. So uh, you can think of it like TurboTax for immigration. Oh, turbo wow. immigration. 
Turbo, <laughs> Tur- <right>? Turbo Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And yeah. Brooke, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Canada is having kind of an immigration boom right now. Like this is a big growth market uh, to be entering. Like you probably timed this extremely well. Um, yeah. Was the timing my doing? It, it, you know, it just kind of <laughs> happened. Um, but like I said, I've been in this um, space now for over a decade. Um, and the innovation that we are creating and implementing in our company has been over the last three years. Um, but yeah, Canada has experienced uh, unprecedented growth in immigration levels, both in permanent residents and temporary residents. We have, you know, close to, if not over 1.5 million people coming to Canada a year, if you add up wow. both permanent residents, workers, students, visitors. Um, so a high volume of, of people who are applying to come to Canada in, in some capacity or other. Um, and yeah, so the, so the timing is really, uh, really important and definitely the right timing. If you're looking at an opportunity scan for, is it, is it the right time for something like what we're doing? Absolutely. That's interesting. I, I, you know, so thinking about this, so first off, like I, I didn't immigrate in Canada. I've never immigrated to another country. So I'm not really, you know, I don't know all the steps, but what I do know again, from the consistency office experience is that it is a very difficult, very convoluted, very time consuming process. And uh, there's like big backlogs and all you hear about is kind of like that it's sort of a problem. So, so I'm guessing when you went out and you, you obviously you saw the problem, you, you were kind of like, helping people manage it. What made that leap from like, how how did you decide one day that, Hey, I'm going to go from, this is something that I see every day to, I'm going to actually go out and try and do something to better the world, to try and solve this problem and and build software. Like, are you a coder too? Like, how did that happen? Like so many questions. (laughs) (laughs) No, not a coder. Okay. Let's break it down. Um, how did we get from, you know, that traditional consulting model to our innovative, tech enabled um, delivery. And it really was motivated by a number of factors. One being we were looking for ways in our business to be more productive. There's a lot of repetitive and sort of lower value tasks involved. Like again, take the passport example, right? Remember those cards that we had to put over top of the signature box so that oh, people yeah. could so sign people wouldn't blow it. and yeah. not go outside of the out, box. If you sign outside that box, it like a passport candidate it's like, well, getting this sent person back, right? isn't qualified for a passport. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Totally. So there's just like so many low value tasks where we're like you don't need me, an expert with years of experience and education, to be doing this aspect for you. So, and and honestly, I don't I don't want to be doing those things. I want to focus right. on the high value, that really strategic expert stuff. Um, and so it was fueled by that, as well as people just, you know, getting the response of, oh, that's a lot of money. Like, how? Let me get back to you. Like the sales cycle was long because financially the the price point for that full white glove service is quite high um because like you said it it is convoluted and it just takes a lot of time and time is money um so we wanted to find a way we we identified that how the industry was operating was no longer in alignment with consumer perceived value Um, So we needed to find a way to deliver our expertise in a way that the value we were delivering was recognized by our consumers. So um, by developing our platform, what we've done is we are rejecting the status quo. There's other um, tools out there that automate and streamline the process, but it's it's an improvement on the status quo. What we're doing is we are rejecting the status quo and how we work with our clients and we've created a new one. We've, we've uh, dubbed it our done together. And that's the TurboTax um, model where we work together, the clients in the driver's seat, they're putting in their sweat equity, moving their application forward, and we're there to direct them. We're sitting in the passenger seat with Google Maps, making sure they they take the right turn at the right time and have that strategic support. So when they have questions and there's we run into some nuance or a roadblock, that's where I'm most valuable. And so how do I provide more people with that highest 
value that I have to offer. So that's really what's driving it was was the um, inaccessibility from a financial point, just it being too expensive and knowing that the the value alignment was, wasn't there and we needed to bring it back into alignment. Um, statistics from the government that we obtained show that max 20% of people who are making applications to, for immigration are using an authorized paid representative. Okay. And so what are the other 80% doing? Like, is it easy? And I can tell you it's not because coming back to our Queens days, I actually went back to Queens a good old decade after our undergrad and did a master's um, in innovation and entrepreneurship. And so I dove into my industry a lot and used that as an opportunity to really study the, our, our ideal target audience profile. And it's not that people find it easy. It's just that they're willing to take the risk and to experience that discomfort and pain point because the price point of getting that professional support is just too high. So we wanted to solve that as well That's interesting. and make so, it more accessible. So you basically, if I think about like a market segmentation here, you have, because well, the one thing I was going to ask you, because I got thinking about it was, you know, how much money do these, like you, you know, I think you're a business, right? So how much money are you going to get from like the average consumer trying to do this? Like, would they have like that kind of disposable income to spend on this sort of thing. Now, of course, it's a very important thing in their lives. So that that definitely helps. But I do, you know, I, I was kind of wondering, like, what what does that look like? Like, where if it is it is it because, as you mentioned, 20% there have something have some sort of uh, tool, I guess, is it that that 80% can't afford another tool? Or what is what's your take on that? Can or don't want to, or like, right. the, again, it comes back to the value perception of the perceived value isn't high enough to be worth the price point of the traditional um, service delivery. Interesting. Yeah. And it sounds too like the original, I, I think you call it the white glove model that you were doing previously to 2016. Um, it was just unscalable as well. It was yeah, just, exactly. you know, like I, I, Dave and I talk about this a lot when we see businesses that everybody perceives as unscalable. And then somebody figures out a way to scale it, that's when they're going to be incredibly successful. And it sounds like that's exactly what you guys are trying to do is take something that's kind of unscalable yeah. and make it scalable. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, looking at from the business perspective, the unit economics, yeah, it's not scalable for every additional dollar you add in revenue. That's more that you're adding in cost because it's highly labor intensive and skilled labor, which means especially in recent years, that labor, the cost of that labor is skyrocketing because we're a Canadian company, our, our employees are in Canada. Um, so it becomes very expensive. And then you hit that ceiling of what people are willing to pay and but your costs keep increasing. So how do we make a more viable, scalable business model that also enables us to scale our impact? Because in this model, we can offer our services at a price point that's more palatable and acceptable from the people that we're seeking to serve. And we can serve approximately six times more people in the same amount with the same amount of human resources. So we're able to scale that impact we have um, by allowing, uh, enabling ourselves with the use of the tool we've created um, to serve more people. That's cool. So let me just add a couple of buzzwords here because I love buzzwords. Uh, so, I mean, I love and hate them, but anyway. So let's, first off, you're doing it differently and we're still yep. different, so let's go. Um, and then secondly, as I, I, what you're doing though is you're, you're disrupting a traditional market, right? You're going yes. in the way this is traditionally done is this kind of labor-intensive, consultant-heavy, uh, cost Expensive. Intensive. Yeah, yeah, very expensive. For the so, user, for the consumer, yeah. Yeah, of course. And now you're offering a different path that it's kind of like, it's not, I wouldn't call it white glove. It's like gray glove. It's like, we're there when you need us. You know what I mean? If yeah. you, you it, when you're at the important moments, we're exactly. there. Exactly. And you it's throughout. I mean? And and I loved something that I heard at Collision. It's enabling human to be more human. So like the, the use of technology. So yeah. instead of one thing we learned is, um, it, and the feedback from customers is it's, not something, this isn't a matter that people are going to, are willing to use a completely automated service yeah, because see that. the implications on family, future, career are too high that the trust isn't there. So we're implementing, we've developed and we're implementing a technology that allows our humans to be more human by when there are those touch points, 
that one-to-one, it's focused on that high value exchange of information and expertise, um, which is incredibly valuable. I feel like there's, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when I think about a lot of like government forms and bureaucracy and all that stuff, there's like the instructions that you get from the government. And then there's like all these like read between the lines. You kind of have to know it's experience based, which obviously <laughs> you'd be bringing to the table. Right. But, but if you're yeah. doing that in an automated way, like if you, you I, I'm like, I don't want to know. I'm not, I don't even know if you have an AI tool or not, but if you, if you had an AI tool, right, it's just going to go, you know, fill out the form. Yep. Whereas and I think this is where yeah. the human element that's what we're is. Doing. Yeah. yeah. So exciting. And so that's what we're doing. And it's funny you say that because I had this exact conversation with a representative from Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada at Collision. They sought us out because they saw our profile on the app. And they're like, we knew that we wanted to come and find out more about what you're doing. Cool. Um, and one of the things I said, we had an amazing conversation. It was um, like, they were just as interested in speaking with me as I was to see them there at my <laughs> sure. booth. Yeah. Um, and so that was really um, inspiring. And what I said is I was like, IRCC, like your recipe, your, the steps in your recipe, you've got step one, you've got step three, maybe you've got step seven. So our tool, what we've built incorporates very robust, advanced process management and automation functionality, which we're filling in the gaps. Like we add step two, three, four, five, seven, right? Like we fill in the cool. gaps yeah. from what's missing on IRCC's recipe. Um, and then we're automating as much of the, the process as we can, like the fundamental um, building blocks that are applicable to every application and then what's allowing us to be the more human being more human is where there's nuance and where something deviates from the norm or the standard which happens in every everyone's scenario it's just it, it and it's different every time that's where that human component that very high level human component comes in which really differentiates us from some of the other technical um on technology-based platforms or tools that are, you know, coming into the market in our space is that we have that human element throughout. Um, so there's always a human behind it. And with my over decade of, of experience and the processes that we built out internally, we've basically just taken the SOPs, which we've built over years in our traditional consulting firm, and we've just flipped them outward, put them in a digital tool and automated them. Nice. I mean, I made it I'm sound not... simple. It wasn't simple, but that's, that's yeah, me that in a it. nutshell. Yeah, yeah, we just, we you know, it was super weekend. easy. We, yeah, I, 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 I got to think, like, is there some way that you can get the immigration's, like, call center to just, when they get one of those terrible support calls from somebody, be like, yo, just go over to this website and use this <laughs> thing and don't call here ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the that's it. Yeah, I, don't talk to us. Don't, don't talk to us. <laughs> Nothing to do good. Um, and th that's what I was um, chatting with the the IRCC rep that came by. I was like, he's like, how can how can we help? And I was like, I need an API into your systems, just like TurboTax has into CRA, um, mm, because cool. what we're doing it's saving so much time. It's removing so much waste because if there's a real human being who can get and, and using our tools. So we have implemented some like basic AI at this point um, where we have validations that catch things. Like if someone says, oh, I lived here. Um, and then another area of the application says, oh, I worked in a completely different city. It'll be like, oh, hey, cool. This doesn't seem to add up. Um, you know, let's let's double check that. So we can catch things and make sure with combining the power of the platform we're, we've created plus the human intervention, we can identify areas where additional clarification might be needed or something needs to be revised or fixed. Um, identify that before it gets submitted to the government. So it's saving time on the government side. They're not receiving an application that's incomplete or submitted in the wrong category. It's saving clients time, like applicants time, because they're not redoing applications multiple times. And it's saving our time by allowing us to help, like by enabling our applicants to prepare their applications with the support of our 
tool so that when we do connect and have those touch points at the key milestones, everything that's been done to that point has been done according to our recipe. Um, right. So yeah, it saves a you lot know, of time funny. and eliminates a lot of waste. You, you guys talked about working in the constituency office and checking passports. And it's almost like you're too, like, that was really good training. That was like a really good setup life experience for you to build your product, because that's kind of what it's doing. It's, it's like, you know, the pre filter before it actually gets to immigration. So actually I'm sure immigration must love it yeah. when an application comes through your system because they know it's like pre-checked. It's like, you know, it's less likely to have issues. Is that right? I mean, I don't know that they can endorse, um, you know, like one, <laughs> yeah. one Chris professional over another. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do believe that they are likely um, quite happy when they receive uh, well-prepared applications because some, right. there are some systems where you can submit an application into the wrong system or it will it, it will allow you to submit an application that's based on information that's not actually accurate so that when on the government side that hu real human intervention takes place this is after months if not sometimes over a year it gets canceled or rejected as incomplete which is just such a waste yeah waste of everybody's time right so yeah like i guess um you know, this is, I, I find it really fascinating. I have a lot of thoughts. One is like, you know, you wish the government, and I don't want to make this a rant about the government, but like, I wish that, you know, like systems and bureaucracies were easy enough to navigate. That you wouldn't need something like this, but at the same time, it's great to have this because now the quality of applications, the quality, like that process will be a lot smoother for everybody, for the people yeah. applying and for the people reviewing. I wonder, do you have some like big success stories or like maybe something that inspiring that's happened so far with people that have used your, your software or where are you at? I right mean, now? the amount of times that I hear, wow, that's exactly what I'm looking for. How do I sign up? Um, Here's my and credit just the, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, that feedback from our customers where they're more than happy to pay for a service where they can easily see the value that they're going to receive from it and and clearly identify that the value they're receiving is worth more than the price they're paying for that service like that's super inspiring and motivating to keep going everyone i talk to um because i do like handhold and nurture those leads um right now very very carefully and personally because it's something new right like yep it's mm -hmm. something that doesn't exist in our space. So mm -hmm. it takes more effort for the moment to help people understand what it is and make sure that everyone's mm -hmm. expectations are aligned. Um, but it has been really, really encouraging when we get, wow, that's, that's really awesome. Like I've never heard of this before, but this seems like exactly what I want. And then to see people go through the process and get their approval and be like, wow, like the, no the number of times that a, one of our clients has been successful using our model, using our platform, and at the end been like, I wouldn't have been able to, I, I can't imagine getting to this point without what you offered. Right. So that's yeah. really encouraging. I, I think I can hear uh, some of your uh, delighted customers in the background uh, screaming for joy. <laughs> okay, <right>. you sorry. <laughs> You have twins, oh. right? I think you have twins, don't you? Yeah, I have two-year-old twins. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. That's super cute. Uh, that's super um, cute. Yeah, Brooke, they I were to ask, out of the ask, house. <laughs> I want to ask you a question. Back. If we rewind back to business school for a second, like I think of like marketing class and advertising, I always say the best form of advertising is word of mouth. My gut tells me this is like the softball of word of mouth advertising. <laughs> What, what do you guys do for, you know, client acquisition? Like, does, is it a lot of word of mouth or is it, do you guys do heavy duty advertise? Like how, how do you guys find new clients? So we've primarily grown by word of mouth referral. Um, and we are the, like, this is the first year that we're really engaging in more, um, a more concerted effort in marketing. And the reason behind that is we believe so strongly in the impact of what we're doing and how we can positively 
improve people's lives that we want to get the word out as much as possible so that someone that felt like they couldn't afford that support but really desired it that they know there's an option um because we know that the impact of the work you know that's why we say we're unlocking infinite human potential and co-creating a better world because when people have that support you it's just like in business when we have a business coach and when we surround our pe- is ourselves with people that you know are our cheerleaders and lift us up how much more we're able to accomplish so if we can reduce stress and just make this journey this massive journey in someone's life a little bit easier and more straightforward and allow people to feel more supported in it like imagine what can be accomplished by that individual in that company in that community and in our country as a whole so now what we're doing is we're not it we, we focus on how do we drive our impact and that in turn drives leads and drives business um yeah. i'm very much a believer in you know if you're doing something with impact the money will follow and and that's right. my ethos yeah. that's what we that's what what drives us absolutely i love that i think that is you, i would call you like a mission driven organization like what absolutely which is which is what to be honest, if you're going to be successful in the business world, that's incredibly important. That's going to drive your culture. That's going to drive your like also how your employees look at their work, how focused they are, how dedicated they are, how loyal they are. That's going to drive results in the market. Like it, it, it affects everything in your business mm-hmm. in, a, in an incredibly positive way. So I love that. I was actually going to ask you, <laughs> can you think of any startup myths or things that surprise you that, you know, People might think that, oh, it's all just about the dollars and cents. But if you actually accomplish something really meaningful, I think that is going to lead to the dollars and cents. If you have a different myth, I'm down to hear it. But that's where I'm at right now. (laughs) Yeah, I I would say, you know, that's definitely one um, that I think for me, and, and I believe that everyone's entrepreneurial journey is different and what draws you to it differs. So for me that that myth of like it has to be about like how do you scale and get that hockey stick growth Uh, for me that that wasn't what was motivating for me it's how do i get that hockey stick impact which makes Uh, doing the work i do fun and when i'm having fun i'm more creative and when i'm more creative you know like uh, the it drives results more than any you know increase in my bank account would drive so I love that the hockey stick growth curve of like impact. I love yeah. that. That's it's amazing. That's such a good idea. Nah, you should uh, you trademark that right now. Trademark, <laughs> trademark. Yeah, that's That'll be for your book. You know, yeah. that, is, that yeah. is fantastic. So. But yeah, I, that would definitely be it. I was thinking as well, like as a sub, just you asked before, are you, are you the coder? Like I'm not the coder. Um, and I don't have a tech co-founder. Um, I voluntold my husband, who's a a techie guy (laughs) that he, uh, you know, he's now my CTO. Um, but I don't have a tech co-founder. And so I would say, um, one thing I learned from my masters was tech is an enabler. And because I felt held back by the fact that I didn't have that technical knowledge, but I have the domain expertise. I have the business expertise, right. And you need that to direct the tech um you know like the tech is there to solve a business need that serves a customer pain point so not being the tech founder and not having a tech co-founder like i've still built a really amazing product there's ways to outsource um bring in fractional Mm -hmm. um expertise so that would be another one but what's driving us is definitely that you know deviation from you need hockey stick growth for your for your startup to be worthy of recognition or like be defined successful. And I loved at Collision, there was a booth that's like be a camel startup. And I love that. Like instead of a unicorn. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. 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 You know, that slow and steady, sustainable growth. Yeah. I think, you know, it's like, it's like organic growth. It's like normal Mm -hmm. growth, like sustainable, good business practice growth, which is entirely reasonable. And the good thing, and if you're having that impact, then like, what is the problem, right? Like I yeah. definitely, and I, and you know, if that's organic growth and, you know, for example, like getting venture capital funding and going that road is like inorganic or unnatural or like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, doesn't feel right. I, I love that take as well. So, and I, mean, I think too, yeah. Yeah. I think as well, like 
for impact startups and something that felt really uncomfortable for me before was like, I do want growth. I do want significant growth because I know the impact. So the financial success in the business isn't mutually exclusive from the impact. They actually go hand in hand. Like I used to feel almost guilty of like, oh, well, if I'm, if I make a lot of money or like the company's wildly financially successful, that that couldn't be possible at the same time as impact. And so that's also really untrue. You can have a wildly successful um, and valuable company financially and be equally as impactful. Yes. Right on. Yes. I love that. <laughs> I'm a hundred percent in agreement. Like, and this all used to drive me nuts. Um, uh, a friend of mine works with a lot of social enterprises and social enterprises are awesome. And I think you're not far off to be honest, but, um, I just, it, it always kind of frustrates me because there's like a fear of profit, like, and a fear of like financial success, but the better you are, the more you do that, the more you're accomplishing your, your mission. You exactly. Know, and more, and, more you and you mission. need that financial success to then be able to reinvest. Like you need profit yes. to be able to keep going. Like that's business. It's, and so it's just an indicator of how well you're fulfilling your values or living your values and fulfilling your mission and your purpose is like an indicator, like profits, an indicator of that. So it's not something yeah. to be like afraid of, or almost like ashamed of, like it's because you're doing good, like business for uh, good. You, doesn't mean you, you can't not be profitable. Be, do not be ashamed. I'll be yeah. mad if you're ashamed. I think that's <laughs> awesome. This no, I, I have you're profit really goal. Like, and, and I intend and that's what's also driving us i love there's that venn diagram where you're capturing business value and customer value and like that middle where they yep. overlap is is the sweet spot like i am also driven by making a very financially um sound business model that is highly profitable mm -hmm. absolutely cool yeah. well brooke uh, i think that's basically all the time we have today this was an awesome discussion i am fired up about that. <laughs> so <not> gonna lie. <laughs> me too. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, folks. That's another episode of Startup Different. Brooke Finley at Navio. Uh, thank you again. Great talk. Really interesting software. Wish you all the best as you accomplish what is a very noble mission. And folks, uh, we will see you next week. Follow the pod on social and uh, review us and all that good kind of stuff. And we will see you next week. Hey, you made it all the way to the end of the episode. Nicely done. If you enjoyed this episode, like, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts so the almighty algorithm can help others find us. Want more from Startup Different? Check out our book, Startup Different, the myth-busting blueprint for your multi-million dollar business. Follow us on social. We're big on YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn. You can also check us out at startupdifferent.com. See you next week. <laughs>